Mm. So um, uh, with over 20 million active customers and about 165 million visits per month uh, from 15 countries, uh, Zalando is uh, truly Europe's uh, largest fashion platform with the aim of really connecting people to the latest fashion via a seamless uh, and simple user experience. And of the 12,000 employees, um, the Berlin tech office uh, has about 1,600 uh, developers, uh, data scientists, agile coaches and, and leads working in small uh, autonomous uh, teams via a framework called uh, Radical Agility. So very briefly, um, Radical Agility is uh, Zalando's new um, tech culture. Uh, and this quote by our VP uh, summarizes it best and emphasizes true agility and innovation. Hire the best people and then get out of their way. And more formally, uh, this uh, graphic uh, shows the form of team organization at Zalando now, which contains purpose or the common understanding of a bigger framework. Autonomy or a responsibility to, to make your own uh, decisions. Uh, and finally, mastery, uh, the pursuit of uh, constantly improving yourself. And this framework is based around uh, trust. And it's with this philosophy that Zalando is moving towards a fashion platform. One of Zalando's most important uh, parts is the core wholesale business, which is where I work as a data scientist in the article sales forecasting team. We cater to provide forecasts uh, for the processes of reordering uh, articles in season, pre-ordering new articles one season ahead, and also uh, optimizing uh, discounts based on certain constraints, uh, either from the wholesale or from uh, logistics or, or warehousing. Right. So in this talk, in this journey, um, when I first joined uh, Zalando, there was already a sales forecast uh, running in production. And I want to talk about its problems, its issues, and how we went about um, fixing them in the context of the, of the wholesale use cases. And this will lead us from the uh, kind of the problems of machine learning and data science to the problem of data uh, integration. And uh, I will present to you uh, how we manage uh, data at scale in Zalando. Finally, I'll discuss some key uh, takeaways, especially when developing a, a data science product uh, in terms of uh, some best practices that we've learned. Okay. So this was the, the, the original sales forecast uh, engine, and it was a monolith. Uh, it got its data from Exasol, uh, and this data was in Exasol was uh, populated by, uh, uh, with appropriate data from the uh, business intelligence te uh, teams. Uh, <clears throat> and the forecasting engine was this mixture of different forecasting models uh, needed for the different use cases that we have. These consisted of uh, predicting, uh, in terms of time series, the number of uh, returned items uh, and uh, the cost of, uh, of these returns, the cost of fulfillments, and predicting, more importantly, the, the number of sold items uh, that, uh, of before return for each of the 15 countries. We also have a forecast. Uh, this also, this monolith also consisted of a, of a forecast for elasticities and demand estimation as well. And this architecture uh, meant that it was super difficult to extend or maintain uh, if any of the core uh, data scientists or developers uh, left the team. And when radical agility happened, uh, this is exactly what uh, what uh, what happened. So we needed a way to continue to extend this uh, super critical piece of uh, wholesale uh, and extend it uh, without uh, the forecast being uh, down. Uh, because a, a less accurate forecast mean, uh, means additional costs of uh, millions of, uh, of uh, euros, since the Lando buyers uh, could end up purchasing too much of a low-performing article or too little of a top seller. Both of these cases are super bad. So autonomy and radical agility means uh, that each team can choose uh, any technology they want. And they themselves, the team is responsible for running it, with each team 
uh, more or less getting a, their own AWS account. Teams and applications con talk to each other via a RESTful API. And so moving forward, we also decided to break up this monolith into smaller microservices, each of which is designed uh, to serve a single forecast uh, model, and then use best practices to tie these uh, simple uh, models to the original forecast. And one initial issue was uh, uh, since uh, Exasol, our, our database, was running in our data center, uh, we could not access the data there from AWS. And so what, hap what we ended up doing was uh, uh, we uh, had a team that, uh, given a query, would uh, put the results into an S3 bucket on AWS, and then our models could, could use that uh, for uh, retraining, for example. So this process of uh, migrating uh, our, our models by breaking them down uh, and into microservices uh, and, and deploying them on AWS continues to this day. And um, uh, the added benefit of this has been that uh, these forecasts are not only being used by our team, but also by uh, teams outside of wholesale as well, like logistics, for example. OK, so speaking of uh, use cases, um, what I want to talk about is uh, uh, the pre-order use case. So very briefly, this pre-order use case is uh, one of the most important aspects of the wholesale team, where buyers need to plan the merchandise one season ahead. Because the articles they plan to buy have no sale history at Zalando, we generally have no data in terms of uh, demand forecasting to support the buyers and the planners. And the original way of solving this problem was that uh, you hand-selected one or several articles and then used the forecast to more uh, important, uh, use the forecast, or at least the historical data of these hand-selected articles uh, to then uh, see what the demand of these new articles w w could be in the future. And uh, this uh, process is uh, not only tricky, but it's error-prone and uh, um, because once, if, the, the, if you select a base a reference article which is uh, different in, in its price, then uh, you have to kind of uh, do a, kind of a lot of tricks to uh, make the forecast accurate. Also, you have to integrate the demand as well um, in terms of um, in terms of how uh, Zalando, in terms of how the article uh, uh, each year uh, the demand also increases, and so you have to incorporate that in the forecast as well. All right, uh, it's an empty slide. All right, so moving forward, what we've done is to use uh, uh, an internal project called uh, Fashion DNA, uh, which combines the article images, uh, so images uh, of each article, with uh, together with a vector of their properties and use uh, and user preferences, and kind of encode that into what we call Fashion DNA. And this vector is trained by a, a deep neural network and has the property that similar articles lie close to each other in, the, in this constellation of uh, this fashion DNA. So now we can automatically find very uh, accurately uh, reference articles that best match a new article. And by looking at this reference article, we can uh, more accurately predict what uh, the sales uh, or how well uh, a new article will sell in the future. Um, so that's the pre-order use case, and the, this whole this whole process kind of works uh, on the on this core uh, technology, uh, which is uh, uh, which uh, w which is not only used by our models, but more or less every microservice at Zalando. And this is uh, the Nakadi uh, bus project. So the, very briefly, Nakadi is a RESTful API. It's built around uh, uh, Kafka, which is a kind of a streaming uh, data uh, protocol. All right. So this allows teams to not only write uh, data to a common bus, but more importantly for us, it allows uh, uh, application to subscribe to uh, event streams or, or the data that uh, one is interested in. And then uh, as this data becomes available, our microservices uh, get that data more or less in real time. So it's quite a sophisticated uh, project. And it's also among a growing list of projects that Zalando has uh, made open source. So you can also check it out. 
One important lesson with, uh, uh, with uh, Nakadi, however, is that, uh, uh, that we found was that uh, the, when communicating via APIs, you end up using JSON, and JSON uh, has the property that it lets you, um, lets you um, have uh, nested data structures. When storing data in a, in a traditional database, that doesn't work. So what we found was that we needed to uh, flatten uh, this, uh, this, uh, this JSON uh, nested data structure and then put it in our, in our, uh, in our own storage. But the great thing now is that we can uh, now utilize a number of, uh, uh, of uh, stream processing uh, frameworks uh, to, for example, keep pre-computed views or of, of queries that we do very often. And this way, we can, do, uh, we can compute queries uh, in a more or less real-time fashion. Whereas before things was uh, things were done on a on a week on a weekly interval, now we can uh, do forecasts more or less in real time. All right. So to summarize uh, the evolution of the architecture, what we started with was this uh, uh, was this uh, Exasol database where we got incremental updates every week. We now have this data stream that uh, let lets us uh, get data more or less in real time. The connection to the database, remember, was this single uh, Exasol database, uh, which we connected via JDBC connection. Now, thanks to REST, uh, and, and uh, we, we can uh, connect to our data via an API on AWS. Where we had only Exasol and, and, and a traditional Postgres in the data center, uh, now each team is responsible for its own data. So uh, we have a whole host of uh, different options to how we want to store the data if we wish to on, uh, on AWS. Um, <clears throat> before, as I said, uh, BI was responsible for getting the data and putting it in a single source in terms of the data delivery. Now, thanks to Nakadi and the, the data stream, um, the data can be uh, can be used not only from uh, the data is not only um, uh, goes to a single source but can uh, be used by multiple and it is used by mul multiple uh, microservices uh, in Zalando. Right. And this mechanism not only scales better, but allows us to have use cases and applications which were not possible uh, in in the traditional setup before. Right. So that's the innovative bit. Um, all right, so to finish, more or less, uh, um, the architecture allows us to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to do a quite a number of innovative things in terms of data science and machine learning. And so here are some kind of key takeaways and, and best practices when, when doing that. <coughs> so the first thing you want to do uh, is, uh, uh, before you kind of implement anything, uh, you want to make sure that uh, you implement all the key KPIs of the models that you're interested in uh, by kind of having a, having a microservice that uh, tracks these key, key metrics, getting its data from the Nakadi stream. This is key since when the model comes online, uh, we can track to see what changes and what stays the same, and um, so that we can then continuously improve. Next, we want to keep our machine learning models initially super simple and spend most of the time to fix the numerous issues, uh, which are the most time-consuming issues of integrating this microservice into the existing or current running forecast. So microservices give, give us this flexibility uh, because uh, of interchangeability uh, and uh, also the fact that uh, the old service can keep on running while we maintain the, the older parts of the forecast. So the idea of a single service providing a single model means that we can now also test it independently. And, and specifically, we want to be able to test the features that we create without being confounded by other, uh, other aspects or other models. And uh, we, um, we want to make sure that the features are correct and uh, the trained models uh, themselves uh, for each of these microservices don't perform worse than the original ones. We also want to detect problems as well. And we have a central process at Zalando for monitoring and alert alerting called Zmon, which is, as far as I know, also open source. Uh, and I hope 
um, and with that, uh, you can uh, quite easily uh, monitor your services as well. So I hope these uh, best practices and projects inspire you also to uh, think of more innovative ways of uh, bringing data science and applications to, to production. And uh, with that, uh, I will finish and be happy to take any questions. Thank you.